Extra Minutes. Hi, it's uh, Saturday the 8th of March. The reason I'm doing this video is because on Monday the jury will retire to consider the verdict in the, the trial that I've been involved with uh, for the last five weeks. Around the incident between Rochelle and I on the 16th of July 2012 and I wanted to get my thoughts out uh, just in case I get the verdict that we're not expecting and I, um, I go to prison next week. I just want everyone to know that uh, what really happened that night on the 16th of July was almost exactly as I explained in court. And the reason why I could explain it so well in court is because it's been living inside me for 18 months. Every day I think about what happened that night and... Um, the movements of ourselves inside that unit and uh, one good thing that came out of this trial is that finally I was able to get that off my chest and uh, tell everyone exactly what did happen. I shouldn't have been there that night. Uh, I went down to Sydney on the Monday. I had no idea what was going to unfold because I didn't have any plans in particular to see Rochelle. I didn't have her address um, until I, I found her address out in, in a car, in the, in the car park of the Sanofi building. And then, uh, obviously, the decision to go around there that night uh, is going to haunt me for the rest of my life. I'd never, ever threatened her. She knew that I wasn't a physical threat to her, um, and that's why she let me in. I, she didn't want to see me and didn't want to talk to me, but she knew that I wasn't going to harm her as such. But as it turned out, um, things ended up very differently. Uh, we had an argument, and uh, as I explained in court, um, I insulted her pretty badly um, and she slapped me, I pushed her and that's when she went for the knife and I think the fact that I did grab her by the scruff of the neck and pushed her, that did make her physically scared and uh, it was just, we were in the wrong place at the wrong time in that unit because this is where I pushed her into the kitchen was where that knife was. If, if we'd been in the lounge room or somewhere like that, things would have been so much different but can't take that back now and when she came at me with that, that really large global chef knife, um, you know, at, at first, the, the very, in the first moment, I didn't think, you know, that she would use it on me. But after she, she slashed me and caught me on the, on the palm of the hand and then slashed at me a second time, and then a, and I, really, I knew that I was in a lot of trouble because I had no, nothing to defend myself. And um, I was in very poor physical condition. I'd been sick. I'd suffered depression for the last three or four months. And... I'd lost a lot of weight and I just wasn't in a good good shape. Uh, and she was so angry. She was so angry uh, and probably scared. Looking back at it now, once Rochelle grabbed that knife, um, it was never going to be a good result for, for one of us. Um, so I just, well, I couldn't let go of that knife and I pushed around the unit and I really struggled because uh, she's very strong. Uh, the autopsy shows that she's 70, she was 70 and a half kilos and 169 centimetres. So... And she was fit because she'd been in training for, she was doing a, a half marathon or some running or something like that. And uh, she was in really good shape, as she always has been. And uh, I struggled, I really, really struggled to control her in the, in the initial part of the fight. And then we, we both crashed to the ground, I was explaining court, and it was just such an awkward position, an awkward fall, and the knife hit her in the side. And the, f the thing was that not, neither of us really knew the extent of that injury because we... we I could see there was blood on the knife, but there was the struggle just continued as it was before, and uh, she was seemed to be as strong as ever. And then, probably the hardest thing that I've had to live with, uh, because the stab wounds were completely accidental. But the hardest thing I've, I've had to live with was, I looked at her in the face and I said to her, I, I pleaded with her to let go of the knife, and I asked her uh, so many ten times to let go of that knife, and she just wouldn't let it go, and. I, I guess looking back at it now, she probably thought that she didn't want to let it go because if I got it, I would do something to her with it, which wasn't going through my mind, but perhaps that's what she thought, and she just wouldn't let, shouldn't, wouldn't let it go. And I held my fist up to her, and I said, Rochelle, let it go, let it go, I'm going to punch in. It took a lot. It hurts today, that punch, because I looked her fair in the eyes, and she looked at me, and I punched her very hard. Uh which was a tough thing to do, but at the time, I just needed to get that knife out of the, 
out of the equation and that's how I did it. And I did get it out. She let it go and I put the knife aside. Um, if I could change anything now, I would not have put that knife back down. I should have just kept it in my hands and gone to the door and opened it. Um, and it would have been, I wouldn't be sitting here today. As I explained in the court, unfortunately I didn't get to demonstrate the neck wound, but it was just such an awkward position because I was was on top of her and, and trying to push myself away from her in a, in a, in a sort of a crouch position, crouch, leaning over her, and I was using her as a leverage. So her she was holding my hand like that, and I was pushing down against her hand as leverage to, to push myself up. And all of a sudden she just gave way and it, and it dropped. And uh, I'll never forget... Even though it happened in an absolute split second, she, I just never forget her turning her, she just turned away, turned her neck away like that and the angle of the knife just went straight into her neck and all I can remember is the, the blood just started pouring out of her neck and she looked at me and I looked at her and we didn't even say anything, nothing was said. We both knew that it was a really, really serious injury. Uh, the blood was pouring. We were laying in the on the ground in the living room and the blood was pouring out. I sort of got up. She got to her knees and I just grabbed her hand and I said, uh, Rochelle, hold on to it. Put a, just put a hand on her neck and I just said, hold on to it. And I just absolutely was freaking out, um, as was she. And I panicked. I'm, I'm not very good with blood. It just the side of that blood and... and uh, I, was, I felt sick straight away. I didn't. I just didn't know what to do. I'm standing there, knife in my hand. She's bleeding. People are bashing at the door. They've been bashing at the door for the last sort of five or ten minutes. The police were on the way. Um, I don't even know to this day why I left. I just had, I just couldn't be there. Um, I was scared. I panicked. Um, I just looked at the balcony door, went and opened it, jumped over the balcony and left. Um, I just hope they make the right decision because the right decision is to find me not guilty. Because I am not guilty. There's no way in the world I deliberately or with any intent tried to hurt Rochelle that night. It was just the way that it panned out. I haven't won anything. My life's been destroyed, um, as has the Yo family's life. It's not a good thing. No one wins out of this. I hope justice is done. And I want people to see this uh, video message to understand that um, I'm telling the truth as to what happened that night. You people that know me know that there's no way in the world I could punch a woman in the face, let alone stab her with a knife. It just, it's just not my go. It's never been in me. It never will be in me. People know that. It was just a tragedy, the way things happened that night. Um, I'm so sorry to the Yo family. I hope in some way the, the trial gives you closure, um, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.